So this is my first time in like a hundred talks not having a slide deck or a computer. Okay, so I'm nervous. All right, I'm super nervous. I'm, I don't have my 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 crutch or my mech suit. Um, so I will talk about a little bit about Kubernetes, and then the goal here is you can ask me anything. Okay, I won't give you any Google trade secrets, but I promise to give you my honest opinion about everything. For example, I don't really like Joe Beta, but he happens to be one of the creators of Kubernetes, so I'm forced to get along with him. Okay, I'll be that honest. Okay, so 1.6 is out. Um, the, the goal of 1.6 is to really shore up the core things that we made promises on, things like RBAC. So if you're a patch provider like OpenShift, um, you've been trying to handle all of these things yourself at a higher level than Kubernetes, which is really fighting the system. The core system itself needs to have the ability to have detailed and granular RBAC roles and permissions against the resources that you manage in your cluster. How many people here have played with 1.6? And turn RBAC on. So my biggest fear is that RBAC may turn into the SD Linux of, of Kubernetes, where people just figure out how to turn it off. And I think you all should join that conversation when 1.6 ships, because there's going to be an easy way out, but we hope that the community doesn't take it, because we won't learn anything about how a system like Kubernetes should interact, especially when you start to think about add-on services. Today, all the things you run in a Kubernetes cluster are pretty much run in God mode, right? You download something from the random internet. How many people are doing this? pulling things from the ransom internet. Raise your hand, because you know you do it. <laughs> You'd be lying. Right? So all of those things pretty much have root inside of your entire cluster. So you pull down a controller, it actually has the freedom to create anything that it wants inside of your cluster today. For most enterprises, we're starting to get into a maturity phase with Kubernetes. That's not going to work anymore. So discipline is starting to enter the platform. So you're going to have to actually start to deal with things like RBAC, and things won't work by default unless you give it granular permission. So this is a good thing. We hope people don't abandon ship on it. Uh, the last thing is around some of the cluster bootstrapping stuff. Um, you guys may have heard of Heptio. So this is one of Joe Beto's uh, startups that he started. And one of them, like he's going to be a mogul. Um, but their goal is to make Kubernetes much easier by doing the work inside of the core. So over the last couple of years, I have personally had the feeling that core or, um, Kubernetes itself is experiencing a little bit of the journey that Linux kernel has experienced, right? You have things like Slackware, Red Hat, Debian, Ubuntu. We're in this world of Kubernetes distros. Now, the danger here is that if we have too many of these distros and they start to fragment from each other, this thing we call Kubernetes starts looking different depending on what distro you're using. So it's important that we actually start to focus back onto the core, define what it is, and keep it simple. Part of that work is making sure that it's easy to install a secure Kubernetes cluster. So having the cluster nodes be able to come up and bootstrap themselves by minting a certificate and using that for future communication. So those are like the two big things around 1.6 that I think will change the way people operate and think about a cluster. And the other things to me are more of moving things from beta or alpha to beta and beta to stable. And you'll see some of that in the release notes. So that's it for now, but I'm going to open it up for Ask Me Anything. All right. So my background here is I've been dealing with Kubernetes for almost three and a half years since the project came out. You were the first external committer. Yes, the first person to get contribute access that wasn't at Google. And since that time, I've been building things around the edges and working with lots of large companies dealing with Kubernetes for the first time or scaling beyond their initial use cases. Okay? So I'm happy to share all of that learning with you guys. Open it up for, for questions. Don't stand there. This is a meetup, so you're actually supposed to. There you go. Good. So the question is, there's this movement around the open service broker. Do anyone know what that is? Raise your hand if you know what that is. How many people have heard of Cloud Foundry? OK. So in the Cloud Foundry world, and you can also think in uh, another path as a service like Heroku, this idea that when you write your application, the way you connect to things like a database, there's a service middle layer, a broker in the middle. So things like credentials and what you connect to, that should be largely hidden from the application developer. Now, the goal with this design is that um, you as a person creating a service, a database service, a payment service. So ideally, what you can do is say, hey, in order to connect to that payment service, here's the bit of data that the application needs. Okay? So that pattern proved to be popular in the enterprise world, right? maybe where people don't have a, much, a lot of time to spend on doing the integrations. right? Like you and I would say, how about we just use Puppet or Chef? 
put it in the config file and off you go. Problem is that in that world, there's no auditing. There's no central place to gate who has access to what. And when you have that central broker, you start to get some of the stuff that you see with like HashiCorp's vault, where you can, as an application, knock on the door and be minted a set of certificates or credentials just to connect to that service and it all be tracked. So the idea is to bring some of that ecosystem into the Kubernetes world, right? Now, I'm of opinion that this shouldn't be a core concept, right? To me, this moves Kubernetes too high up the stack. This will be useful for something like Deus, OpenShift, um, you know, Cloud Foundry just announced that their Bosch tool will be able to install Kubernetes. So they're starting to, to touch on those edges. So to bridge some of these systems, that service broker pattern becomes critical for a lot of people who are used to working that way, right? My opinion, I think it will add value to people who like that model. But for people who are more of a roll your own, who will use something like etcd or console for service discovery, and they're OK pulling their own configs and secrets, I don't think it's for that crowd. But we remember, Kubernetes has grown up now. right? So it's being used by a lot of enterprises. So that work is driving lots of things in Kubernetes. So the last thing I'll talk about on that question is there's been a work around um, being able to give, have policy inside of Kubernetes, inject things via an emission controller into a pod. So the idea would be you as a developer, you wrote an application, and you're not really familiar with the environment that you're being deployed in. The cluster administrator could define that any pod that looks a certain way is injected with, let's say, some certificates, some secrets, an additional volume, right? Something that we can do is rewrite the pod on the fly based on the administrator's policy. So that keeps you out of knowing what's being injected. Maybe there's something that we know you need, like TLS certificates. So when I was playing with this, particular pattern, the idea would be all of my apps are these small Go binaries that don't have a base image, but then they don't have any TLS certificates, so the root CA doesn't work. So in this case, instead of me going into every pod and writing this little volume section where I'm mounting certs from the host, I can actually have a different thing do this at, at runtime, right? So you launch the pod at between the scheduling process and running on a node, you're going to be injected with all of these things, okay? But that work was to help support the service broker model because when you say, hey, I need to talk to MySQL, well, all those things could be generated on the fly and then injected into your container as an environment variable as, or as a volume, okay? So that's the thinking with the service broker. We want to open up the ecosystem, right, as a community, but it's not necessarily something I think everyone will have in their Kubernetes cluster. All right, fantastic question. You got it. So this service broker thing is big, right? In order to make it all work as fluid as people uh, have in their minds, you're going to need work around the edges. So this thing I talked about will enable the service broker to be able to inject things via policy, right? So all of these things will come together. It's going to be a lot of work to get that same experience that you see in something like Cloud Foundry. But just know that the community is working towards this step by step and identifying bits and pieces that are moving. So you as a developer, let's say you had a service broker inside of your environment. You can have three different views to this or multiple views. One would be like push to deploy. I need Postgres, but I don't care how you do it. Maybe that pulls in a container, does something, creates some secrets, and then registers it, and then you can just deploy your app, and then the service broker will do all the binding stuff necessary for you to use Postgres. Or you may be a producer. You may be building the payment service at your organization and you provide a service broker binding. No one needs to know anything about your app other than how to get through it through the service broker. So to me, this might be a bigger story. I don't know if it's all fleshed out, but for me personally, I never worked in that model. And if I have, it's been completely transparent to me. Okay? Any other questions? What's the roadmap for secrets? So the question is, what is the roadmap for secrets? All right, so this is a good one. Uh, when secrets is built, um, contributed mainly by the community. We need a way of injecting secrets with our application. What were people doing before? You were copying files. What were you doing? Copying files to servers? Puppet or Chef, right? Effectively cap glorified copying files to servers. And most people were okay with that. But in the Kubernetes world, it's a bit hard because you don't know where things are going to land. So we have the secrets API. So the secrets API, I think people are happy with. The API, meaning store something in Kubernetes, refer to it, 
and at runtime, we bind it to the particular pod that needs it. Great. Problem is that most people don't have any security whatsoever. No TLS between the components, right? So then those secrets are passing being plain text. Some people don't have um, the disk encrypted at rest. So if you're storing an etcd, anything that's snapshot to the disk, it's just laying there in plain text. Um, cloud providers, not so much. For instance, most cloud providers, when they bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster like we do at GKE, we lock down all that stuff. So what's the remaining problem with, with, with secrets? Uh, Docker rightfully pointed out that, um, and they solved the problem halfway, because I challenged them on this one. So in Kubernetes, when you make a secret object, by default, all of the nodes in the cluster are free to pull any of the secrets that they want. Right? That's just the default setup before we have our back. Okay? So now a pod is placed on any node, and any node can look at that pod manifest and go grab the secrets. This is all being well behaved. But what happens when there's a malicious actor on the node, and they have this token or this access to be able to pull any secret that they want? So now secrets become something that every node can see whether they need to see them or not. That's the first problem. This is because we have a, essentially a pull model for secrets. right? The nodes pull on demand. So in order to make that work, we need very rich RBAC. Right? I actually have a prototype that I built on my laptop where the node can never get to any secrets by default. After a scheduling decision is made, and I know that it's running on that node, I can dynamically go to RBAC and say, this node with this name can see these exact secrets very explicitly. So then you get yourself in this very dynamic model that allows that pull model to be um, consistent, be audited, and be locked down and match what you expect. Now, Docker solved this problem by doing a push model. So the node itself has pushed its work. Run this container. Oh, yeah, and here's the secrets that go with it. Everyone's like, that's perfect. Why shouldn't Kubernetes just do the exact same thing? The truth is it only buys you half the story. What happens when you write a service? Someone's going to have to do rich RBAC at some point. They can't push everything to everything. right? So at some point, they know they trust the node because it's been bootstrapped. And then they can push to an endpoint that they minted a certificate for. But what happens when you start to have third-party tools and clients? What are you pushing to? Right? So eventually, they're going to have to solve the rich RBAC problem to make this actually work. So for us, we're taking it serious. So for us, RBAC will probably start to have a little bit more capabilities on who can see what secrets. That's step one. Obvious thing to do. Joe actually has a lot of insights, who I talked to a lot about this because he knew how we did it in Google and just has experience with this stuff. Is really, um, it's more of an identity problem, right? What is your app supposed to be doing? It's not about pushing around secrets and who can push secrets around them secure. What you really want is what Vault kind of hinted at. If you have an identity, then I can associate policy to that identity, and then secrets and database access. access is an implementation detail. All right? I just need to know who you are. We don't have that. So that's probably the problem we need to start thinking about in the Kubernetes community, is that when you come up inside of a pod, how come we just don't give you an identity that can be trusted by other systems? Okay? So there's a doc that Eric Toon, um, he's running, I think, leading the security SIG. They have a doc about all the phases. So I built some prototypes around Vault integration. I think a lot of people are running to consensus that we don't want to just expose Vault to the entire Kubernetes system. That will break a lot of APIs and guarantees we have. So when you look at that formula, there's low-hanging fruit, and there's a broader discussion about how do we make it easy to identify the thing that needs secrets in the first place. Okay? So hopefully that answers the questions about secrets. But a lot of people are working on this. A lot of people that actually know what they're doing are working on this, which is the good part. The hard part is convincing the entire community that we should move in a certain direction when people have other views about how it should be solved. OK? Fantastic question. I'll take two more. So the question is, what do I think about Go clients against the Kubernetes API? Man, <laughs> this one I get in trouble for all the time. Um, so inside of the Kubernetes core code base, the client, to me, grew organically. right? We were using it internally. And of course, it made sense that people would want to build things on the outside. And Google does a good job, in my opinion, of API-first design. So you at least have some sort of contract between you and some other components in Kubernetes. 
The problem though is that there's a lot of implementation detail in the current client. So if you've never built anything on top of Kubernetes, if you import the Kubernetes client into your application, let's say your application was about five megs, that's where you started. You import this thing, what, 50? Like, not laughing, like people import it and they build and it's like, this is 50 megs. What the hell is in here, right? And you essentially imported all of Kubernetes into your application. So the team is working on it. One, one goal was a stepping stone is to at least have a nice swagger spec that we could generate clients from or at least conform to what our promises are. The second thing is we've started to move the client to its own repository. The problem though right now is that we're effectively just copying it from here to a third party place. That's not the solution. Me, when I build tools, I don't use the client because I actually like using the HTTP semantics. The problem with the HTTP interface today is that some of the stuff is implementation detail, like the math on scheduling. Like, what is a CPU, a millicore? How do you subtract the millicore from some other unit that Kubernetes has? That's Kubernetes' own implementation detail. So I'm stuck either reinventing that for every language that I want to write in, or bringing in that 50 megs only for Golang. So we need to fix that. We need to define some more clarity to me around all of these parts of the uh, client. And then you also have the kubectl factor. Kubectl does a lot of magic sauce. You say kubectl, delete a deployment. And it's like, wow, I cleaned up everything. Life is great. And then you go and build against the API. And you say delete deployment, and a bunch of pods are laying around. OK? So we need to unify what it means to be a client of Kubernetes. And a lot of people are thinking kubectl, not the raw API that we actually present. Okay, So lots of work going on there. There's a SIG running that around the API machinery um, pop in there. But people have good ideas. And the community is moving forward by generating clients off of the Swagger spec. Okay, I saw a hand up here. No. no. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You got it. I was just going to ask about, I've heard a bit about this kind of the ingress controller and adding kind of HTTP awareness. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. All right, so we talked about this core thing. So the question is, um, we have this thing called ingress inside of Kubernetes, right? So if you think about Kubernetes, we take infrastructure and we extract it away. And you just give us a, a, a YAML file today. And you say, hey, I want this many containers running. We make it so. And then people want to do things above that. How do I get traffic to these particular things? So we have service discovery that lets you give us labels to identify what belongs as backends. So we collect that list, right? We have this thing called endpoints. That's where all the healthy pods are registered. But then we have this idea about how do you integrate with higher level components like a load balancer? So there's a question here, what is a load balancer? Nginx, HAProxy, Google Cloud, ELB? None of them work the same. So to me, one flatal flaw was to make an ingress controller that attempted to normalize them all. I just want to have this path-based routing, maybe do TLS termination. And for a lot of people, you get kind of that Heroku model, and it's a good starting point. I was with a customer the other day, and they're trying to do regex matching on the paths. There's already a problem with regex matching on the paths. But the thing is, Nginx supports it, but we don't do it in Google Load Balancer. But the problem is now you're stuck with the ingress controller that won't let you do that. So then some solutions would be, let's add an annotation. right? So then if you put an annotation there, that will let your Load Balancer know that it should interpolate these paths as regular expression, but be ignored on another platform. So now we start to get into this world where we're now configuring what an ingress controller is through this abstract concept. And no one knows what that is because most of it isn't documented. It's ours to be specific. So ingress was this attempt to let you integrate with load balancers depending on your provider, Nginx, HAProxy, or the cloud provider. But focus on the common denominator because that would solve some percentage of the use case for everyone. What's turning out is that we probably are going to be better off saying, this is the engine X ingress controller, and here's what it supports, right? And I don't know if these things will be ever to be fully portable the way most people really use a load balancer in practice. Okay. All right, I'll take one more. You really have one. Other than that, no hands. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>